it's, it's really my pleasure to introduce Mark and Navdeep. Uh, if it wasn't for them, this would still be just a bunch of crappy Python code and blog post. So I'm, I'll always be thankful to them for taking my crappy Python code and turning it into an actually usable program. And, and there's really nobody else that's, that's better suited to teach you guys how to use this program than they are. So uh, with that said, let's go ahead and uh, get you logged into Quick, Quick Labs. Uh, let us know if you're having trouble following these directions. We're assuming most people have, have kind of gone, gone through this before in other hands-on sections, but, but just put your hands up uh, if, if you need help. We're not going to start the lab yet. We're going to just go ahead and get signed in. Uh, Navdeep's going to do some slides, and then we'll, we'll get the, the lab started about halfway through. And we'll take questions on slide.io. We'll, we'll do questions at the end. That's right. OK. So, so the, if, you're, if you're asking about not seeing it in the catalog, that's because we're shutting down the instances from the last class. So, so um, you, don't, you can't choose introduction to driverless AI yet. So you can just wait until that pops up, or it, it'll pop up you know, in about 20 minutes when we, when we actually start the lab, okay? What's that? 2.15, okay. So around 2.15, the, the lab will become available. Show of hands for, for who's gotten this far. Are people able to get into Quick Labs? Okay. Looks like there's plenty of open seats if you don't mind moving. We can, or we can try to debug that in just a second. Looks like he's going to look at it for you. OK. So uh, let's start talking about machine learning interpretability. Here's Navdeep. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah? I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, so yeah, today we're just going to talk a little bit about machine learning interpretability and how you can use it in driverless AI. Um, I'll be going over some of the methodologies that we have put in um, MLI. Um, so I'll just start off right now. So MLI in general, uh, you know, interpreting machine learning models is, is something that's pretty big in the past couple years. Um, so these are just to point out a few um, articles that have come out um, in, in academia and press. The key one I want to point out is the one about the European Union. So next year, there is a chance that the European Union wants to heavily regulate automatic decision making. So what's automatic decision making? That's basically any decision that is made by an algorithm. And they want to enable customers of certain companies or things like that to ask the question, why was I denied for my credit card? Or why was I denied this loan? And the company itself has to explain that. So machine learning interpretability is very important from an org a organizational standpoint and also a machine learning standpoint as well. So I'll briefly touch on some of the big ideas that we have about MLI, and then I'll kind of dive into some of the algorithms that we will be using later on when uh, Mark demos it. So here's a typical uh, use case you would, might see in a data science application predicting if you should approve someone for a credit card or not. So you have this unknown target function, you have some training examples, um, you have some hypotheses on uh, what might cause someone to default on their credit card versus not defaulting. And then you have some learning algorithm that you want to use to kind of automate this process. And then you end up with some final hypothesis. And then most of the time, data scientists think their job is done at this point. Um, that's until they go talk to their boss, and their boss says, well, why did this happen? How, how can you explain this model to a regulator? Um, so that's where this part comes in. You have to explain the hypothesis. The final hypothesis that is made has to be explainable to people, and people have to understand it. Uh, these people could be regulators, stakeholders, customers. Um, it's very important that we sort of make this machine learning process transparent to everyone, whether they're a practitioner or not. So, you know, just hinting on what I said before, we're, you know, trying to increase fairness, accountability, and trust between the ML community and people like consumers who actually um, have decisions made for them day to day based off of machine learning applications. Oh. 
So I'll kind of go over a framework for interpretability um, that we have come up with at H2O. So first we'll talk about some of the complexity of learned functions. So it basically breaks down to three things. Uh, you have linear monotonic models. These are the typical regression models. And they're linear in, in nature and also they're monotonic, meaning I can tell you at what direction the outcome is going to go, positive or negative, and by what magnitude. Because with the linear regression application, we have coefficients. So the coefficients give us some magnitude on how the outcome is going to change in a positive or negative manner. We also have nonlinear monotonic uh, functions. These are sort of machine learning functions that are constrained to be monotonic. So the difference between this and the linear monotonic is I can tell you what direction the outcome will go based off of some variable uh, set but I can't tell you what magnitude. It'll either go positive or negative. So libraries like XJBoost, for example, have this monotonicity constraint where you can kind of control the outcome in terms of its positive or negative nature. The last one is what most people are used to seeing in machine learning, nonlinear, non-monotonic. So these are very complex functions that you can't really explain um, initially. It takes a lot of digging to figure out what's going on with the model itself. We also have a scope of interpretability. So we like to think of interpretability in two phases. There's a global interpretability aspect in which you try to explain uh, the model from an average standpoint across the entire data set. And we have a local interpretability aspect in which you try to zoom in to certain parts of the data, whether it be a cluster or a row, and you try to explain um, why that decision was made from the machine learning algorithm itself. Another thing that we find very important is enhancing trust and understanding. So uh, humans in nature, you know, we, we tend to ask why things happen, and we need to have some transparency on why things happen. Um, that's what we're trying to achieve with MLI. We want consumers, we want customers to kind of understand um, why the machine learning algorithm made the decision that it made, and hopefully uh, that'll cause some trust to happen between ML and, um, and consumers. The last thing is the application domain of MLI. Uh, we firmly believe that MLI should be model agnostic. We don't want very model specific type things because then you kind of get stuck in using that for a specific model. If it's model agnostic, you could use it for a wide array of applications and that becomes very useful across many industries where different algorithms are used um, all the time. So let's talk about some of the big challenges. So, what we get with linear models is we get strong model locality, so, which means the models and explanations are stable. So think of a typical linear regression case. Um, the coefficients are understandable, and the model itself is understandable, so you're able to explain things. You know, an increase in x by this much gives an increase in y by this much, or vice versa. This is a typical linear regression case. With machine learning, what we get is most of the time we get approximate explanations for exact models. So we get models that fit to very complex curves, complex data sets, but it's very hard to explain those models itself just out of the box. That's why we call it you know, a black box model. It's very difficult to explain um, actually most of the time. So what can we, what's a typical approach we can try to do? So linear models provide exact explanations for approximate models. And machine learning provides approximate explanations for exact models. What we can do as ML practitioners is try to find a balance between the two. Because at the end of the day, we do have to explain our model to someone. Whether it be your boss, stakeholder, regulator, you know, the model has to be explained. And you as an ML practitioner should have doubt about your model until you can prove it is trustworthy. Because eventually that model will go into production and it will um, make a decision that could be either detrimental to your business or detrimental to a consumer. So you have to keep these things in mind um, when you're dealing with these type of things. So next I'll talk about a few of the, the algorithms that we've implemented in MLI and what, we're gonna, and what Mark will be showing in the demo later on. So the first one is partial dependency plots. So this is a very common technique from uh, Jerome Friedman at Stanford. Um, the basic idea is you take a variable x and you vary it across different values and you see how the model responds to changes. So imagine if I have a value like education and I have categoricals like, you know, they finished high school, they have a bachelor's, master's, or a PhD, you know, all those levels I can vary in the model itself and I can see how the prediction changes. This gives me some indication on what the sense of reality this model has. 
because you have to realize that you know, the data is the reality, and then the machine learning model itself develops its own sense of reality on what it thinks it sees in the data. We have to ensure that the model is quite stable. We have to try to get, dig some insights into how varying uh, certain um, predictors will affect the response itself. Another technique um, that is quite common from you know, old data mining literature is uh, surrogate models. So the idea behind surrogate models is we take a complex model, we train it on a data set, and we, then, we, then we predict Y. So now we have this Y hat. And what we do is we take that Y hat and we append it to the training frame and pass that training frame through a simple model. This simple model could be, let's say, a GLM, a single decision tree, something you know, very simple that you can really understand, um, um, where you, that you can really understand the outcome. So the idea is, is you, know, you could do this, and then you could kind of understand, kind of dig into what this complex model was doing. So imagine the scenario, I build a GBM with 1,000 trees, max depth is 10. Like, you know, this is a very big, complex model. But then I take those predictions and I attach it to a GBM or a random forest with one tree. That's a single decision tree. I can literally plot that decision tree for you and tell you why this, that decision was made in an in a approximate manner. So I won't be exact, but approximate explanations are better than no explanations at all, because no explanations will lead to nothing. The model will not be ex accepted by anyone at all. So another technique is Lime. So this is what uh, Samir Singh was talking about yesterday, if you guys attended his talk. Um, the main idea behind Lime is if you have, let's say, a single data point that you want to explain, um, you build a linear surrogate model, so just like what I mentioned before, but that surrogate model is built around points that are close to that data point. So you see here, x is, x is the data point we're trying to explain, and we're gonna build a linear surrogate model around, uh, around the points that are around that uh, value. What that does is it kind of zooms into that data point and kind of gives us some reason codes or explanations on what's going on for that single data point. What we did in MLI is we did a variant of that called K-Lime. Now, the way K-Lime works is you take a data set, you take a training data set, and you run K-means on it. And you, of course, you optimize for K, so let's say clusters are five. So I have five clusters in my data set. For each cluster, I build a linear surrogate model. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the entire training frame and I'm zooming in onto specific clusters and building a linear surrogate model. That linear surrogate model in this case will be a GLM. Now with this GLM, I have coefficients and I can explain that local region of my data set. You can also build a global surrogate model, which is what I explained earlier. So you take the Y hat, you attach it to the training frame, and you run a GLM on the entire data set. So when you run K-Lime, you always end up with K plus one surrogate models. And all of these models can be used to give reason codes as to why a decision was made by this uh, machine learning algorithm. Another common technique is um, variable importance measures. So I'm sure all of you have uh, seen this, whether in the H2O package or actually Boost or some other package like that. So the global variable importance um, is um, basically quite simple. All it looks at is let's say for a tree-based model, all it will look at is how often does a, tree, a variable show up on top and how frequent. So this is for a single decision tree and the one that does this the most is the most important variable. For GBMs, it's the same for a single decision tree except we'll average across the whole ensemble. And for random forest, it's the same as well except we'll do an out-of-bag uh, accuracy check. So basically if the accuracy goes down, that shows that variable is very important um, in this technique. What we added in MLI is a uh, is a technique called uh, leave one covariate out, also known as loco. And what that basically does is it says, okay, I have this y hat that I predicted for this example. Let's say the first example is a, is a man, so his sex is male, he's age 11, he has this value fair, 8.45, and we predicted y hat to be 0.2. What leave one covariate out says is, let's take uh, out the variable sex, you know, set it to null, and see how much the response changed. So if the response changed heavily, then you know, like in this case, it went to 0.01, that that variable is very important for that row. And that causes some you know, investigation on your part to kind of figure out what's going on. We can also do the same for, for age itself, and you see that the variable or the response didn't change um, as drastically. So this is one way to kind of have, like back to the notion of global versus local, this is a way to have global variable importance, which is the common technique most of you have seen, 
And then there's this local technique uh, that is used to get local uh, interpretations. So now we'll sort of talk about the product roadmap that we have for MLI. Um, we've been working on MLI for the past maybe six months or so, and um, I'll just explain what we're planning to do uh, in the near future. So one thing we want is to have reason codes uh, in production. So the KLAM technique I presented earlier, uh, that could be used to get reason codes. And reason codes are basically, you know, for a particular row, why, did that, uh, why was that response made? Um, we would like to get this in production so customers can use it uh, on a you know, day to day basis and get you know, real time reason codes for what's going on. We also want to add in sensitivity analysis. So, sensitivity analysis is basically we want to give a customer the ability to perturb the data in such, and then see how the response changes. Um, this will sort of show you how stable the model is and also show you some interesting insights, hopefully, into what's going on with the model itself. We also want to work more on multinomial uh, machine learning interpretability. So right now, for multinomial machine learning interpretability, we only have variable importance and the local method I mentioned earlier. We want to expand that out to you know, use PDP. Um, that's something we, we've seen in the literature, but we want to kind of implement it ourselves and put in the MLI application. Um, so those are the three short-term things that we're aiming to get done. Um, sort of medium term is we want to add in stuff like residual analysis, uh, table plots. Table plots is sort of like target encoding and you're looking at the frequency of the response uh, for certain uh, variables. Uh, we want to add in a Python API. Uh, we're thinking of maybe uh, running this whole MLI on GPUs, but we haven't explored it uh, further enough yet. And we also want a way to export a report that people can use. So, you know, you can, you can go through this whole MLI application, but at the end, most people want something tangible that they can, you know, take to their to their boss or to the regulator and kind of, you know, something they can use to prove that their model is adequate or to prove that the model is inadequate. Uh, so we want a way to uh, have this, you know, downloadable for people so they can use it in, uh, you know, real life applications. Uh, sort of long term is we want to maybe explore a R API if uh, some customers have asked for it. So we're thinking of exploring that as well. And also auto MLI. So yesterday Aaron gave, gave a talk on auto ML. We were thinking of auto MLI and you know, the high level idea is, is you pass in you know, a data set with some predicted columns and we automatically figure out what's interpretable, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what are some key things. Um, right now this is very high level, but it's sort of just, you know, just a high level idea that I thought I should share with all of you. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is some of the resources that are available to you today um, that you guys can use and get up and running on uh, with uh, MLI. So we have the booklet that you guys have probably seen around the conference. There's also a PDF version of that available as well. Um, there was an article posted, uh, I think, either last year or earlier this year uh, from Patrick Hall, Wen Fan, and our CEO, Shri. Uh, it's about ideas on interpreting machine learning. Now, it's a pretty good article. It was uh, published uh, through O'Reilly. So you guys should definitely check that out if you want to you know, get more details on the methods that are used in MLI. There's also this conference called uh, FAT ML. It's basically about fair, account I think it's fair accountability and trust. Um, and it, the whole conference is surrounded by MLI. The, the, the whole point of the conference is trying to make machine learning interpretable and trying to make it trustworthy, accountable, you know, trying to avoid biases that you would see in um, machine learning applications. And of course, um, much like how we have been at H2O, we also have an open source, uh, um, you know, open source notebooks available to you so that you guys can you know, just get up and running using core H2O3. Uh, there's, you can use these Jupyter notebooks to do these PDP plots, the K-Lime, everything. All that should be available as an open source uh, Jupyter notebook as well. And we also have the books by the door for anyone who hasn't gotten a chance to get one yet. The, yeah. So that's pretty much all I had to do today. Um, next up, we'll have Mark come up, and he'll give you guys a demo of uh, MLI through driverless AI. Can you log into your Quick Labs? Your Quick Labs? Thanks. 
Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to run the demo for MLI. Um, and it looks like um, I, I want to help you guys go through the quick labs to make sure that you, know, you guys can follow along with what I'm going to show you. Um, so if you guys have logged into quick, lab, quick labs, you should see this screen. And then you click on, so you go to the catalog, and then you click on Introduction to Driverless AI. And then you start the lab. <clears throat> yeah, if you need any help, raise your hand, and we can come around to set you up. So that was pretty fast. Like, it, I already have an address here. So when you see this populate, you can open a new tab, and then you can enter that in your address bar. And you say agree, and then you can enter H2O for your username, password H2O. And then you sign in. So you'll be, uh, you'll be greeted with this page where you're, you're meant to enter your license key. And the license key can be copied from the readme of the instruction page. And you hit save. And now you're ready to uh, run the demo. So I'll just wait a minute or so um, for you guys to get ready. <clears throat> Okay, so for the demo, we're going to import this specific data set. It's um, once you've uh, entered the driverless AI UI, you can uh, go to data sets and you add new data set. Yeah, the license can be found on. So from, from the page that you launched the lab, at the bottom there is a license key and you can just copy that there. This is where you would get the um, license key. The data that we're going to load is credit card. Uh, it's a credit card where the, um, the categoricals are more readable. Instead of saying one, two, three for marriage, it's single, married, or et cetera. Yeah, so I can. So when you go to the UI, You say add data set, and it's under Jupyter, data, credit card, credit card train cat.csv. Under Jupyter, data, credit card. So from, from the beginning, again, it's under Jupyter, data, credit card, and then credit card train cat.csv.
So I'm going to load that file in. And if, if you guys are still waiting for the, for the UI to come up, um, it's OK because I'll be going through you know, all the different features of the MLI GUI. You can just follow along with what I'm talking about. Um, and then when you catch up, you can start uh, playing with the tool on your own. So you may have done this lab already from yesterday. Um, we're going to train a driverless AI model. Uh, so once your data set has been imported, you click on predict. And what you want to do is select default payment next month and turn everything down to one for accuracy, one for time to give us you know, a quick result. So this is a credit card data set where we're trying to predict next month's probability of the customer not paying their credit card. Uh, so some of the variables that are in this data set is whether or not they have been late on their credit card payment one month, two months ago, three months ago, and it tells you what is the delay in their payment. Have they been late for five months for you know, any, any given time period? So right now AutoDL is running. Uh, we're coming up with these engineered features. Uh, they're being ranked by variable importance. Oh, you left click on the circle and drag down. Okay, so now once you're here, uh, all you have to do to run MLI is simply click on interpret this model. Uh, there are other ways to run MLI, which I'll go over later, but the, simple, the simplest way to get started is just to run interpret this model. And so right now it's preparing um, the MLI process. We're creating surrogate models, uh, we're importing data, and uh, we're we're doing all the steps that we need to generate the data to present the, the, the UI to the end user. And we're doing the loco step, which we are um, taking each row and we're scoring it again with variables missing. We're doing a grid search on K-Lime, and then it's, it's done. So now when you get to this page, uh, the, you see four plots here. And so uh, the reason why we have four plots is to show the interactivity between the four different interpretability methods that we have in MLI. So th these four plots work together to give a full story on whether or not this, this data point if its predictions are like, explainable from a linear versus nonlinear point of view. So when you click on a point here, all four plots will update, and each plot will give its opinion on how, like, what is, the, what is uh, the interpretation for that prediction. The first plot on the upper uh, left is the K-line plot. And so the, the yellow line in the K-line plot is the uh, driverless Model, driverless AI model predictions, and we've 
we've ranked them and we plotted against this x-axis. Like it's gradually increasing along the x-axis. So for every driverless AI model prediction, there's an associated k-line prediction. So you'll see that the white dots are the k-line predictions. Sometimes they match up, sometimes they're really far off. So someone could go ahead and just click on this button. Uh, if you have a, for the user, if there's a specific row that they care about, they can enter that row number in and search for it. So I'll go ahead and click on a point. Uh, when you hover over it, it tells you what the K-line prediction is. It's 0.079. Uh, the model prediction here is also 0.079. So this, this happened to be a really good uh, K-line score. It matched the driverless AI score. Uh, so you also see the actual, so in the training data set for this row, it was actually a zero, so they, that means they did not default on their credit card payment for the next month. Uh, we have reason codes here. We show the top five by magnitude. Uh, so, so this is, another thing I should mention is that, um, as Navdeep mentioned, this is K-Lime, so we run a K-means clustering. Uh, so each cluster, we have a GLM model that we fit to, to the data. Uh, you can also select a specific cluster that you care about by just using the selector. And you can go to the global um, plot doing with, with that plot selection. So I'll select a point, and then I'm going to go through the explanations page. So on the explanations page, uh, what you will see is a, um, a comparison of the K-Lime value versus the model prediction value. In this case, it's pretty off. Uh, the K-Lime is 0.48 and the model says 0 0.80. So these, these reason codes may not be reliable. So you may judge, this is the first thing you should look at. And um, I'm going to go and pick a more closer point so that uh, so that I can talk about the reason codes better. So if you're not familiar with the term reason codes, it's, it's basically the attribution for, a, for the K-Lime score. So if my K-Lime score is 0.8, I can break that down to feature by feature, uh, whatever its value is, that contributed uh, how much to the final score. And so in this case, all the positive contributions are listed here in green. All the negative contributions are listed in red. So you see the reason code for pay one, given the value of four for this specific row, it increased the K-Lime score by 0.2. And so what this gives, or data scientists, it gives them the ability to make these models more transparent and they can explain to you know, business decision makers that this is why the model uh, came up with the score that it did. And these reason codes will sum up to uh, the final K-line prediction that's here. Uh, the other thing that we show is that for the, the GLM, so this row happens to be in cluster zero, and we show the R squared, like how, you wanna know how accurate the K-line model is with the model predictions. And in this case, the R squared is about 0.89. And what we also show here is for cluster zero, we give the coefficients of the GLM model. So the coefficient for pay five being eight, that would be 0.38, for example. And we list all of the uh, coefficients for the GLM model in this plot here. And we also show the global reason codes because we, by default, we build a global GLM model on the entire data set. And the reason why we have a local GLM and a global GLM is that if if there is a, um, if the cluster GLM model does not have good accuracy, it will fall back to the global, global GLM. So that's the K-line plot. The next thing is uh, when you, when we update the row, this variable importance plot will also update. So what, we have this theme of yellow and gray, so the yellow being the, the global, uh, the the global view of interpretability and the gray and white uh, points are 
for like local, local interpretability. So when, when you select this point, these gray bars are the most important variables for that given row. So you can see there's, there's some pretty good correlation when I look at the reason codes, P1 is the most important uh, variable from a linear point of view, and P1 also happens to be very important for this given row from a nonlinear point of view. So that's, that gives the data scientists more confidence that both the nonlinear and the linear uh, explanations are, are correlated. So they, they're both in step, and it gives you more confidence uh, to, to use these reason codes and to tell people that this is why the model behaved the way it did. And this bottom right plot is the partial dependence plot. Uh, the, again, the theme is the yellow is the uh, partial dependence plot on the entire data set. It's the global version of partial dependence. And the local version of partial dependence is uh, what we call ICE. And that's the individual conditional expectation method. So for that given row, we keep all the variables the same. But for pay one, we're trying out what happens to the output of the model when we try out different values like minus one, minus two, zero, and so on and so on. And this plot over here is a simple decision tree which we built on the entire data set. And what this lets you do is for a given uh, row that you select, it highlights the path. And if you hover over this gray line, it tells you what value that, that this row had. This, this row, this row uh, pay one's variable has a value of two, and that's why it takes this path to the right side of the tree. Uh, for pay three, it is, if I hover, it's two, so it belongs on this side of the tree, and so on and so on. So you can simplify, you know, instead of looking at hundreds of trees, you can look at one tree to help you explain the, explain, to explain the predictions out of your, out of your uh, driverless AI model. Uh, we also give uh, R squared to let the user know like, how well this simple tree um, followed the uh, auto DL predictions, the driverless AI predictions. So th these are the four plots. They all work together, and it's, it's meant to give you different stories for a single row. And this allows, this allows the data scientists to, to come up with a more, you know, more complex story rather than, than having only one opinion from a single interpretation model. So I'm going to go back to the interpret page. Uh, this will show all the interpretation experiments that you have finished. And I'm going to show some of the other features that you can do with the MLI uh, program. So earlier, we had the experiment finish, and you could select interpret this model. You can do the same thing from this page, uh, but you get to have more options. And so earlier, we did um, k-means to do the clustering. If you, are, um, if you don't like how k-means kind of takes high dimensional space and creates these abstract clusters, you can, you can pick a column to divide your data set by. So if you have domain knowledge and you want a GLM for each unique label in your categorical column, you can pick that here. So someone could, someone could partition by education, for example. Another thing that you can do is so along with choosing a clustering column, you can also use the, uh, the engineered features uh, from driverless AI. So earlier you saw the original features. We, we built surrogate models using the original features to, to, uh, to we, we, build, we, we try to predict the driverless AI predictions with the original features. If you, take, if you toggle this option, we're using the engineered features to do that. So you'll get a better fit because you're using the engineered features. But at the same time, uh, the features are harder to interpret because now they are combinations or transformations of multiple uh, variables. And... The last thing I wanted to show was uh, the new feature that we have is that you can run MLI on external models. So you can follow along if you're running this lab. You can go to, um, 
So what I mean by scoring on external models, if you have a training data set and there's a prediction column in that data set, and that prediction column can come from any model. It could be a scikit-learn model, h 3 model, TensorFlow model. If you have a data set like that, you can import it into MLI and run the same algorithms on that data set. So if you want to try this out yourself, there is a data set called credit card scored. And you can import it. You don't need to run uh, driverless AI. You can just bring in data sets that have models from like outside of driverless. You, and then you can pick the prediction column. And then you can run MLI on that. And so that's about it. Like that's all I plan to show. Um, one more thing I wanted to say was that uh, please give us your feedback on the product because we really do listen to all the feedback that you that you give us. Uh, the feedback is what helps us, you know, prioritize what goes into the next version, and it helps us, you know, shape the roadmap for MLI going forward. So I, I'd be really excited to hear your feedback on this on this product. And um, I just want to, yeah. If you have any questions, uh, please go ahead and put it on Slido. Okay. Okay. So lots of good questions. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, okay, is it possible to change the K of K-Lime before running MLI? No, but there, there's, a couple, there's a couple things to say here. So one is Mark, Mark, just show, Mark just showed you can upload your own clusters, okay? So we have a, we have a, a decently smart way of picking K, which I'm gonna tell you in a second, but if you decide you don't like it, you can just use your own clusters. But, but in terms of picking the number of clusters, that's something that we do for you. And the way that we pick the number of clusters is by maximizing the R squared between the local linear models and the predictions of the driverless AI model. So we try many different Ks, K equals two, three, four, five, up to 20, up to 20? <laughs> up to 20. And the number of clusters that gives the best correspondence between the local linear models and the driverless AI model predictions, that's how we pick the number of clusters. That's how we pick the number of local regions. Okay, so how do we reconcile, like that situ this is a very good question. So how do we reconcile that, the uh, this situation where the local linear models aren't doing that well in terms of being explanatory? So let's, let's examine that exact situation. going to pick a real outlier. Okay. So um, K-Lime, the, the model that we're using to interpret, to derive explanations, isn't doing a very good job in this case, okay? It's predicting like 0.4 when it should be predicting 0.1. I personally wouldn't trust these displayed reason codes, and that's why we show you the difference, okay? Now, um, what you should do in this case, and this, this is why it's nice that this is a interactive application and not just a bunch of spaghetti Python code, is in this case you should, you should use the other parts of the, the uh, tool to explain what's going on. Because likely what's going on in this case is that uh, there are strong interactions that driverless AI has, has picked up on in, in this region or um, the nonlinear model is taking a really hard turn in this region that the linear model can't keep up with. And so that's why we provide these different uh, measures. So loco in the top right is a nonlinear variable importance measure, okay? So in this case, it's very likely that the loco values are much more reliable than the lime values, all right? And, and I think this is one thing that I, I don't see in other products. So we, we've been grappling with this problem of approximate explanations for more exact models for a while now, right? So I see a lot of open source packages that say, hey, 
hey, here's the explanation for your black box model. They're approximate in almost all cases. This dashboard gives you several tools to fall back on when, uh, when one of the explanatory techniques fails or is too approximate. Okay. Um, in general, how do you choose the parameters for the auxiliary explanation models you're building? So I talked about K-Lime. In K-Lime, we do a grid search over the number of clusters to find the number of clusters that maximizes the accuracy of the local explanatory linear models. Do we do, are we doing L2 or L1? L2. All right, and it's in a, the, the um, and no grid search on alpha? Uh, no grid search. Okay, all right. So, so the, the local GLMs are uh, elastic net, elastic net re regression models. They're penalized models. Um, the single decision tree is the single decision tree is uh, just a simple uh, depth three tree. Nothing fancy at all. Okay. There's there's no parameters to tune. Right? We're we're just making depth three splits based on information gain. Um, any? All right. Let's see. How are the clusters determined? They're k-means clusters. Okay. So if you don't upload your own clusters, which I which I think is a very good thing for you to try if you evaluate the software. If you don't upload your own clusters, we will do k-means clustering, okay? Okay, how does the surrogate model, how does the surrogate model explain the case when it, when it disagrees with the complex model, right, since it's just an uh, approximation and not 100%. So one thing, that's why we display these error metrics, okay? So that you can decide whether these, ex whether these approximate explanations are trustworthy or not. So you can see here um, the R squared between the driverless AI model predictions and this decision tree is fairly high, 0.84, and the RMSE is fairly low. So th this is a good approximation of the driverless AI model. If it wasn't, again, that's why we have the different explanatory techniques here for you to fall back on, okay? Because it's very likely that for a very complex model, for any given point, one of these techniques might not, uh, might not be completely trustworthy. And that's why, we're, that's why we're showing you many and giving you many different perspectives and choices to choose from when you build explanations. What features are we using? So, so Mark showed two examples. Um, we can use the uh, we can use the original features, which I personally think is more interpretable, or we can use the derived features. So remember, Mark showed that example of when I uploaded a data set. There we give you the uh, option if you want to see the interpretation in terms of very complex derived features, which can be hard to explain. Right? The features themselves can be hard to explain. Um, if you want to see that, then we can do that there. But generally speaking, we are um, building the explanatory techniques based on the original inputs because we assume that they are more directly explainable than the features that uh, driverless AI is going to derive because those can, those can become very complex. So um, when, when is the local model different from the global model and what does this mean? We always fit a global model, okay? In K-Line, we always fit a global interpretable model. That's what you're seeing here. All right, this is a, the white dots are a single linear regression fit on the original inputs to the predictions of the complex model, okay? Now, it's very likely that if you just use one model, especially one linear model, there are going to be places where that linear model is not very accurate. And so that's why we enable you to zoom in to a local region, right? Lime is local interpretable model agnostic explanations. So we zoom into these local regions that in this case sit, um, are, what are they defined by, this is k-means still, the one that's on the screen, or is it something you loaded? Oh, that's still k-means. Okay, all right, so in this case, we're, this is still a k-means cluster. The local region is a k-means cluster, 
okay? So in, now we are using a different model. We're using a linear model in this local region in hopes that kind of when we zoom in to this local region, where the fit of the linear model will be better to the complex model. Let's see. Yeah, oh, all right, so is there a community version available? Uh, is there a community version? You can, the software that we're showing right now, you can evaluate it for free for 30 days. Okay, and to do that, you go to the H2O website and fill out the evaluation form. We do, uh, and this, we do have open source examples. So these, this is a set of um, open source examples that, you're, that run on H203 uh, and XGBoost and Graphviz and other open source software. And we even have a Docker file so that, you can, uh, so that you can set up an environment in which these examples will run without having to install all these things manually. So um, we do have open source examples for how to do these techniques using Python and H203 and other open source software. But I want, I want to go back and reiterate, I'm not aware of any technique for explaining machine learning models that's not approximate. And so that's why I'm, I'm so thankful to Mark and Navdeep for helping me take this kind of disjointed Python code and put it into this interactive dashboard. Because it's very powerful to be able to see these different techniques together, understand when one might be failing, and be able to fall back to another one, okay? So, so that, that is sort of the value of having all four of these different explanatory techniques on one page and having it be interactive. With the code examples, it's gonna be a little bit more disjointed, okay? You're gonna to have to run one, run another one, and, and kind of try to piece together the results on your own. All right, so, <laughs> seems like, I'm gonna say this one more time. The way, for K-Lime, how do you decide what K is? Okay, I'm gonna, I've answered this question about three times. Apparently, I'm not doing a very good job. Um, we pick K, in K-Lime, by maximizing the R squared, we pick K such that the R squared between the linear model predictions, the local linear model predictions, and the complex driverless AI model that we're trying to explain, we pick K to maximize the R squared between those two things. So we try two linear models and two clusters, and we see what the R squared is between the complex model and the local linear models. Then we try three then we try four, then we try five, all the way up to 20, and we pick the K where the R squared is the maximum. So we pick the K where, um, where the local linear models have the most explainability power, have the most power to explain. Will explanations from surrogate models be acceptable well, under regulations? Most likely not. But um, one thing that we would like to do is give you the predictions from K-Lime, okay? So if you, you can think of K-Lime or any of these surrogate models as something called model compression, uh, a simple representation of a more complex model. And in that case, I do think that um, if, if instead of using the driverless AI model, you use the K-Lime predictions themselves, then that is very likely regulatory approvable. But I, I've yet to hear, uh, typically, and, and from what I've heard from customers, it's very hard to talk to regulators. It's not, regulators don't, um, they're not going for the like, well, this model helps explain this model. This, this software um, is, is perfect for applications like marketing, fraud detection, um, ad serving, out, outside of the heavily regulated you know, credit scoring risk domain, we want to get there. Our eventual goal is to, is to get there so that, that this is just a regulatory approved product, okay? But uh, I would say now, I would say now we're not quite there yet. That's a very good question. All right, and I'm gonna spend, uh, I'm, I'm gonna get this, uh, why did we implement K-Lime versus Lime? Okay. The main reason, it, that's a very good question. The main reason is um, Lime is very difficult to score on new data. 
So remember, when Navdeep showed the roadmap, he said, we want reason codes in production. We want every time a model, uh, a, a score is given from a driverless AI model, we want to say why, where did that score come from? Why did this score happen in terms of the original variables, okay? So, um, Lime is very hard to score on new data in real time. Because to do, to do Lime as it was originally prescribed, I have to take a row of data, I have to perturb it, meaning change the values in it many, many times and make like a little sample, 1,000, 10,000 rows. So that takes time. Then I have to do a distance calculation between the row I want to explain and all those simulated points. That takes time. Then I have to fit a linear model to, to make the explanations. So, so the way Lime was originally prescribed, I actually have to fit a model every time I want to, to score new data. Okay, and if you've, if you've worked in data science or analytics or machine learning, whatever you want to call it, in, in a commercial capacity, you know that it, your, your scoring and your training really need to be decoupled. So it, it, it's, a, it's a bad idea to, to try to, to have um, fitting a model be part of your scoring process. So scoring new data for K-Lime is easy, right? I see what cluster centroid you belong to, and then I apply the uh, parameters of the linear model associated with that customer to you, okay? That's quick and easy to score. Another advantage is we can make this plot, okay? So if you tried to make this plot using the original lime, it would have no meaning. The, the green, the, uh, the actual p pieces of data would be simulated, okay? They, they wouldn't be from your data set. They would just be simulated data. So here we're actually showing you in your data, in data you have a chance of understanding how, is, how the explanatory model is doing, okay? The, the one drawback of K-Lime that you guys have picked up on is that in certain instances it can be less accurate than the original Lime, okay? But we think it's more important to be able to score new data easily and, uh, and that, that's why we went this direction. And it's not that we wouldn't implement traditional Lime, we, uh, we just wanted to make sure that we had something that would work in real time in production before, uh, before we implemented the traditional line. Okay, so we're out of time. We really appreciate your participation. Um, we'll all be at the booth, or somebody will be at the booth if you have further questions. I see there's some questions left. So thank you so much.